see everybody this morning. This cold, gray morning. If you would please repeat after me. Make joy to us to the Lord. All ye may. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord he is God. Know ye that the Lord he is God. And it is he that has made us. And it is he that has made us. And not we ourselves. And not we ourselves. We are his people. We are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. And the sheep of his pasture. Into his gates with thanksgiving. Into his gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. And into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name. For the Lord is good. Say, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures all generations. Again, it's our hope and prayer that you have come uh, this morning for no other reason but to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Open the floodgates of heaven. To stay here longer than things a lot it takes and to watch the fleeting changes of lives on the way. But if my savior calls me to that home on high.
Recognize the grace and mercy you have given us. Recognize the love you have given us through the Son, Jesus Christ. Because of that, we just say thank you this morning, Lord. Thank you for being able to get up this morning. Yes. Be able to prepare ourselves and come and worship you in spirit and truth. Father, we ask you to guide our hearts and things that we do, guide our actions, and all that we bring glory unto you. Father, realize, oh Lord, sometimes we do fall short of Lord. And Father, we ask, oh Lord, that we have that heart of humbleness, have that heart of repentance, oh Lord, seeking to do your will, to glorify you. Father, we pray especially, Lord, for those who may not know of your grace, and I know of your mercy and your love, who are the guilty disappointment of you, that they will be touched by the words we claim this morning by your servant. You allow the word to go forth and bring forth the truth you will have to you. They'll be able to cry out, what can I do to be saved? For salvation is in Jesus Christ. Father, we realize, oh Lord, that the power of life eternal is yours as you give that grace to your son Jesus. Father, we pray for those who make special prayers. We pray for this congregation of people. Father, we pray not only for us and Congregation, Lord. We pray for this nation that we're proud of, Lord. Father, we realize that it's a dark and time. It's a struggle of life, Lord. Help us, Lord, in the midst of this in the darkness, Lord. Shine the light of Christ, Lord. Where we walk, where do we go, Lord? Father, we pray for our future as we come forward, that you touch him, Lord, strengthen him, Lord, because the resolve is standing together. Father, we just thank you this morning. We realize, Lord, that we have our very being because of you and your son, Jesus Christ. We just say thank you in this name. Amen. Amen.
And if heaven is not my home, do y'all understand what that's saying? If I've gone through all this stuff that I've gone through down here, dealt with all the folk I had to deal with down here, crossed every bridge I had to cross down here, and if heaven is not my home, I don't know what I'm going to do. Song says that the angels are beckoning me. They're calling for me, Candace. I'm supposed to be there if I don't mess it up. From heaven's open door. And at some point, He's going to call your name. And you won't be able to stay in this world anymore. God is good. Uh, he's better than good. God is great. God is awesome. God is uh, amazing. He's inexplicably good to us even when we don't deserve it. And for that, we should be eternally grateful. Uh, before we get to our text on this morning, I do want to uh, extend a thank you again from uh, on behalf of uh, my in-laws, our family, the Reynolds family, Long family, Jones family, Hill family, uh, your prayers, your acts of kindness uh, during a bereavement have, have not gone unnoticed. And uh, just want to say thank you uh, for your prayers. Um, we'll be in Psalm 121 on this morning. Psalm 121 uh, on this morning. It's good to see your smiling faces. You didn't let the cold weather and the Little hint of snow stop you on this morning. It's just a hint. Just a hint. It's not that bad, Jamie. Just a hint. Uh, I grew up in Michigan. Somebody had to convince me that it was actually snowing. I thought it was some styrofoam blowing in the wind. It wasn't heavy enough. Um, but nevertheless, God has kept us with a roof over our heads. Yeah. And uh, heat in our homes. And for that, we're grateful. Uh, Psalm 121, Psalm 121, if you would stand this morning, if you would stand this morning as we read, as we read the text. This morning, we'll be reading from the New King James Version. We'll begin in verse number one <clears throat> and read through uh, the conclusion of the chapter, which is verse number, verse number eight. The psalmist writes, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth. And he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. And behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. Somebody say right hand. Right. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in. From this time forth and even forevermore. Verse 7 again says, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil, and he shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out 
and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. You may be seated uh, this morning. <clears throat> you may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we're singing thank, thank you, thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, and I just want to thank you, Lord. Sing, thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Everybody should have something to be thankful for this morning. Lord, we're singing thank Thank you, thank you, Lord, oh, Lord, my God, we thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. So in those songs, can't nobody sing it for you, because you know what he's done for you. Oh, Lord, and I just want to thank you, Lord. Lord, because you've been so good, you have been so good. Lord, you've been so good. Yeah, been so good. I know I didn't deserve it, but you've been, you've been, been so good. Oh, Lord, I know that you've been been so been so good you're so good and I, I just want to thank you you lord yes you gave me one more day lord one more one more one more day Lord knows I didn't deserve it, but you gave one, one more, one more day. Oh, Lord, I'm glad you gave one, one more, one more day, one more day, and I, I Thank you, Lord. Yes, you gave me one more day, Lord. One, one more day. One more day. Lord, I'm glad you woke me up this morning. Gave me one more, one more day. One more day. Everybody who thought they would see today did see today. You gave them one more, one more day, one more day, one day, oh Lord, and I, I just want to thank you, Lord, oh, Lord. You ought to thank God for one more day. I mean, really thank God for one more day. Uh, when you realize how close you were to not waking up this morning, when you realize how close you were to being gone from here, uh, you start to look at life differently. You thank God for one more, one more day. And for whatever reason, on this morning when I woke up, I, I, I was uh, even more intentionally grateful, Rodney. I was, I was thinking about uh, last week, uh, this two weeks ago, uh, I was at Oklahoma Christian still, and 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 uh, we got a, a message on our phones that said uh, uh, lockdown, campus is in lockdown, 
and, and campus was in lockdown. And when you get that message, has anybody here ever been in an active shooter drill? Okay, we'll fix that. Uh, but there are a lot of rules that are contrary to your natural inclination, right? There are things like if you see somebody coming, you can't let them in. Uh, you have to lock the door and get in the innermost places and turn the lights off and all these other things that have to happen. But this alarm comes across my phone and it says lockdown on campus. I don't know what's going on. All I know is I need to find shelter. And as I am trying to find shelter, I find myself in a space other than my office. And so the space that I find myself in very quickly becomes the, the hub or the center, the command center for this crisis. So I thought I was going to be able to go hide a little bit, Charles. But what happened was I had to help strategically figure out what was going on without knowing what was going on. I'm preaching already. Uh, I had to fix a problem that I didn't really know existed yet. And so as we're sitting there, we're trying to figure out what's going on. We're, we're assembling the people together. And as we're assembling the people together, uh, we had had a drill before, but this wasn't a drill. You see, when you go on a lockdown, you don't know if it's a drill or if it's real, right? Because, because the way my life is set up, the way you can just shoot me and kill me, uh, uh, I got to take it serious every time. So what happens is we go into lockdown church, and as we go into lockdown, we begin to see 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 police cars just coming up on campus. Uh, FBI officers are knocking on the door, and I'm a little nervous because they're playing clothes, and I don't know, well, I don't know what, the, what the shooter look like. So they're knocking on the door to get in the command center, and I'm like, no, no, no. And then they finally put the badge up, and we let them in. But all the while, we begin to get more and more information. And what we find out really quickly, Latrina, is that someone has called in a threat for a mass shooting. And it's a very specific, incredible threat. And so as this threat is happening, I totally forget that uh, friends and loved ones who are connected to our alert system get text messages. And so my wife texts me and asks, are you okay? Some of my friends text and say, man, is everything okay? And I can't respond because I don't know if everything is okay. I don't know where the threat is. I don't know what he looks like. All I know is that he's threatening to shoot the building up right across from where I'm posted up. Thankfully, the FBI came and did some due diligence and we were able to ping phones and things of that nature. We realized that although we were in lockdown, there was nothing to be afraid of. Uh, with the help of the FBI, they were able to get a judge to get a warrant to ping that phone number. We figured out where the person really was, and they were out of state. But in that moment, I realized how close I was if he was really there. Uh, I also realized how far away from being in control I really am. It was because of somebody's help we were able to get out of there safely. Sometimes we take help for granted. Y'all ever seen the movie The Help? How they treated the help? I'm not going to make no pies for nobody or nothing like that. Right, but just the way that they treated the people. Sometimes we treat the help wrong. Because help is overlooked. You know, and you need to start being mindful. This is, just, this is free. Start being mindful of the folk that help you out in life. I'm talking about the folk that change the trash where you work and the folk that clean the streets and the folk that cut your grass and the folk, that the, 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 the thankless jobs. Sometimes we overlook help until we need help. Sometimes when we need help, Help is nowhere to be found because we didn't treat help right when we didn't need help. Sometimes I, I'm, I'm uh, fascinated when I watch others preach and I, I enjoy good preaching. And, and, and sometimes uh, uh, when preachers preach, they, uh, they, they, they can, you, you can feel when the sermon is connecting. Or you can feel when, when it's making sense. You can, you can feel with what, when what I've studied, the Spirit has taken it and did his own thing with it. 
Oh, y'all have heard them do that before. You ever heard somebody say, uh, when they're preaching and they're starting to get it, they say, I, feel, I can feel my help coming? I can feel it. And what they're really saying, Tyler, is that I can, okay, God is about to preach the rest of this for me because this is this above my pay grade. And really what they're saying is I'm stepping back so God can step up. And I believe this text this morning teaches us as we continue in our series that my trouble is in trouble, that you have some help, that if you will just step back, he promises to step up. Now for just a few minutes on this morning, I want to speak to you from the subject, I feel my help coming. I, I feel my help. Feel my help coming. I'll give you the three points and then we'll walk through the text. I'll be honest with you. We might just end it up at verse one and two this morning because I, I love this text like that. Uh, but I'll give you the points. Nevertheless, tell you where you find the points just in case you want to go back and study that. Uh, three things that we see in this text and then the lesson will be yours. Number one is this. Uh, even when I don't know if he's hearing me, my help is holding me. Even when I don't know if he's hearing me, my help is holding me. If you're taking notes, write down verses 1 through 3a. If you want to, that makes it easier for you. Verses 1 through 3a, right? Even when I don't know if, if God is hearing me, I've got some evidence this morning that he's still holding me. Yeah. Not only is he holding me when I don't know if he's hearing me, but when I get to verse uh, number 4, I see that although he may seem silent, my help ain't sleep. He may seem silent, but my help is not sleep. Sometimes we allow ourselves uh, to, to allow the silence of life to confuse us into thinking that God is somewhere napping on us. It may seem silent, but, but my help, he didn't sleep. And the last and final thing we'll see in this text around verse uh, number 7 and 8 is that my help is protecting me and preparing me all at the same time. My help is protecting me and preparing me all at the same time. Look at the text on this morning. Verse number one says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? The psalmist says, my help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. Oh, listen, even when I don't know if he's hearing me, I believe that my help is holding me. Church, our text this morning brings us to back to a familiar place. Uh, we're up close and personal again with the pen of the psalmist. While we're familiar with the pen of the psalmist, I want us to be intentional this morning of framing our context, uh, uh, refusing to see this psalm this morning as just another psalm. The 121st Psalm is what biblical scholars call a song of ascent. Uh, the Psalms of ascent or the songs of ascent are a special group of psalms uh, comprising of Psalm 120 through 134. Uh, some biblical scholars call them the songs of the pilgrims. But you need to understand that Jerusalem is situated on a high hill. And Jews traveling to Jerusalem <clears throat> For one of the three main annual Jewish festivals traditionally sang these songs on the ascent or the uphill to the city. And according to some traditions, the Jewish priests also sang some of these songs of ascent as they walked up the steps to the temple in Jerusalem. In other words, church, they were singing these songs as they were approaching worship. Too fast, you just missed your first shout. In other words, they were singing these songs as they approached worship. Uh, they were singing the songs of ascent on the way to worship. Uh, what are you saying, Jones? Somebody needs to know this morning uh, that you ought to have a song in your heart before you get to worship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You ought to already have a song on your heart before you get here. Uh, David put it like this in the 100th Psalm. He said uh, that you ought to uh, uh, come uh, into his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. Uh -huh. uh, the ascent psalms. And so this is not just a regular psalm here. This is a song of praise before they even get to worship. 
Sometimes life will put you in a situation where you're worshiping before you ever get to worship because you realize how good God has been to you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and even on Sunday morning. So by the time you get here, you already fired up. You already ready to go. You don't need nobody to sing your song. You don't need a certain text. You don't need nobody to speak to you. You don't need nobody to do nothing for you. Why? Because you came in. David says in verse number one, he says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Oh, church, here we see David uh, uh, making a statement, and then he asks a question. A lot of times we, 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 we church this text to be all one phrase. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. That's not one sentence. It's a statement. And then a question, okay. Uh, 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 uh. This text is so simplistic in its structure, but it's dripping in power and in confidence. Uh, when you see a declarative before an inquisitive, you have to have some real trust in your answer. David makes a declarative before he becomes inquisitive because he's already got confidence in his answer. He makes a statement before he asks the question, because Charles, he knows what the answer is already going to be. Goodness gracious. Uh, David says, I'm looking to the hills, but I already know where my help is coming from. Goodness gracious. He says, I'm going to look to the hills. I'm, I'm going to look toward my destination. I'm going to look toward where I'm going, but I already know where my help is going to come from to help me get where I'm going this morning. I'm going to look toward the hills. I'm going to look toward the climb. I'm going to look to where I'm going, but I ain't got to worry about how I'm going to get there. I already know where my help is coming from on this morning. And somebody this morning needs to refocus on where it is that God is taking you and stop worrying about how you're going to get there. He says, I'm going to look to the hills. Why? He says, well, let me answer your question with a question. Where does my help come from? When was the last time that when you faced some difficulty, when you faced a problem, when you faced a storm, that you answered it with, with the question, well, where does my help come from? Let me be practical. When is the last time that when you had an issue at the house, you said, well, who, who is the peacekeeper at our house? When is the last time when the doctor said, I don't really know if this medicine is going to work to do what you needed to do? When is you said, well, who really is the great physician in my life? When is the last time that, that the bills and the money just couldn't seem to get on the same page and you answered, well, who is my way maker anyway? He says, I'm going to look to the end because I know where my help is coming from. I'm not worried about what's happening between B and Y because I can get from A to Z focusing on God, focusing on Christ, focusing on the Holy Spirit because I know where my help comes from. And let me say this to you, Eastside, before I move any further, when you know where your help comes from, you live differently. David makes that statement and he makes it a very personal. He says, my help. Can't speak for nobody else, but I know where my help. Is there anybody else in here this morning? You know where your help come from? I don't know what you believe. I don't know what you think, but I know where my help come from. I know when I'm flat on my back that there's nobody but God who can lift me up. I know when I'm going through what I'm going through that there's nobody but God who can bring me out on the other side. I read somewhere somebody said that when I was flat on my back, when I was down to nothing, Frank, all I had was God. Goodness gracious, somebody in here this morning is understanding what David is saying, that I, I, I can ask, I can make a statement before I ask a question because when my answer is God, I ain't got to worry about nothing in my life. Yeah, somebody knows what it's like to hit rock bottom in here this morning. Somebody knows what it's like to, to be desperate for some help and nobody's around to help you. Oh, but somebody also knows what it's like to bounce back because God wasn't done with you yet. David says, my help comes from the Lord, the one who made the heavens and the earth. What David does uh, is that he qualifies uh, uh, who is helping him, and then he explains why he's helping him. He says, my help comes from the Lord. Well, why am I getting help from the Lord? He says, Brother Leo, because he's the one who made the heavens 
and the earth. I want you to understand what David is saying here. He's saying that he was the first helper. Uh, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In other words, he was the first help and he's still, still my help. Somebody needs to be reminded this morning that the same God that brought you through the last thing he brought you through would bring you through the next thing. He says the why. The God who, who, who created the heavens and the earth. Esai, don't miss this. The one who makes a thing is greater than the thing he creates. The one who makes a thing is greater than the thing he creates. So if he created the heavens and the earth, what in heaven and on earth can come against me? David is preaching here. David says, I will lift up my eyes to, to the hills from whence cometh my help. Where's my help coming from? He's, he's making this declarative that I'm going to look toward the hills. Why is he looking toward the hills? Nakiah, he's looking toward the hills because sometimes as they went along that journey, uh, Sister Seals, they get tired. Oh, I got any tired folk in here this morning. Some, sometimes they get weary along the journey. I'm trying to go where God has called me to go. I'm trying to be what God has called me to be. I'm trying to walk the way God has called me to walk, but sometimes, can I keep it real with you? Sometimes I get tired. Oh, y'all don't get tired, huh? Sometimes you get a little weary. Sometimes you just don't feel like being bothered. Sometimes you just, you, you need some help. He says, but even in my fatigue, I'm looking toward the hills because I know where my where my help is coming from. He says, he says that uh, uh, nothing can do anything to me if God is with me. Oh, I read somewhere, I believe it was the 46th Psalm with David. He, you know, every once in a while David gets to talk in this crazy kind of talk where he just believes that God can do anything in the world. David say, y'all, sometimes I get to talk in that crazy kind of talk too. Well, I believe that God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ever ask, imagine, think, or dream. I read somewhere over in Psalm 46 where David got to talk in that crazy talk. And David said, God is our refuge, a very present help. He said, though the earth may give way, if the, if the earth start to fall apart and the, and the oceans fall into the heart of the sea and the waters roar and foam, God still got me covered. Talking about the earth, the, the very thing that you think is security. If your security becomes unsecure, God said, I still got you. God is our refuge. Oh, goodness gracious. David is saying, I, I, I know what it may look like sometimes. But I know what's really going on. Look at the text. Look at the text. He says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. This is the part that I love about uh, this, 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 uh, this, this, this text. He says, and he will not allow your foot to be moved. He will not allow your foot to be moved. Oh, uh, hmm. So, 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 so David is talking about uh, 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 some, 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 some stability, right? Uh, he, he, Thomas, did you grab that for me? You got that for me? Come on. Uh, let me see that ball for just a minute. I need to make this make sense. Now, y'all know we got a lot of bas a lot of self-proclaimed basketball players at the church. But we got some real basketball players too, right? And, and uh, it's some real ones. And, and, and matter of fact, last night, Jill and the girls went and, and, and checked, what's she at? Uh, Audrey Plunkett, could you please stand? Now, y'all might not know. Come on, stand up, baby girl. Y'all might not know that. That's brother, sister Calvin's grandbaby. That's Andy's baby. Come on up here. I'm going to need you to help me. Come on. She's going to kill me. Now, listen, I wasn't at the game, but I do have Twitter. There were highlights on Twitter last night of this freshman balling at Carl Albert on varsity. Now, I'm just, I'm just telling you right now, get a good look because, you know. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to get to my point. After watching the highlights, I'm going to assume you learned your game from Sister Angela because I didn't seen your granddaddy play before. <laughs> I had to get frank. I didn't see the Toledo jump shot there. Now, so in the game of, hold that for me. You left hand, right hand. Right hand. Okay, stand right there for me. Right there for me. This girl's a freshman. Here you go. So, so hold up, getting triple threat, like you're just ready to play right now. If I just pass you, I'm going to pass you the ball. You just catch the ball, okay? Okay, now she, look at the ball, look at that. It's on the hip. That's, that's technique. That's technique. 
ain't never seen Frank do that. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just playing. So, so in the game of basketball, right, for those of you who, who have no idea what we're talking about right now, uh, contrary to popular belief, let me hold this, contrary to popular belief, you cannot just walk them down the floor with the ball. You got to dribble the ball. Or you got to pass the ball. Some of y'all struggle because you just want to walk around with the ball. You can't do that. Right. So in the game of basketball, uh, and, 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 uh, everywhere but the NBA, you're allowed two steps. Right. Anything beyond that is called a what? Okay, y'all know a little basketball. It's called a travel. Right. But what the game of basketball allows you to do, it allows you to move after the two steps without moving. It's called a pivot. Okay, so what happens is I want you to take one dribble, take two steps, right there, okay? Now, we're going to pivot. Now, she's taking her two steps. According to the rules of the game, she can't go no more. You can't go no more, right? It's a travel, right? So now what happens is because she stopped, the defense knows we can go get her because she can't move, right? What, what you yell out from the other team is what? Dead, 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 dead. And what that means is she can't move. We got her right where we want her, huh? Y'all, y'all, that's how Nakayana was at Millwood. They just press it all up on you like that, right? All up on you, just pressing, just pressing. Like a little, look, a little ant. She just was fouling all the time, right? So now, defense is saying, dead, dead, dead. She can't move, right? She can't take another step, but she can pivot. And what that means is, so what I want you to do, which leg you want to pivot off of? Okay, she's going to pivot off her right leg, okay? Now, what that means is, her left leg can move, arms can move, the rest of her body can move, but she could never take that right foot off the ground. Because, let me see your pivot, just pivot a little bit. Just pivot, look, see that right foot, just keep going, just keep pivoting. See that right foot is never, keep going. She's, pivot, she's moving around, come on, come on, pivot like, pivot like you in a game right now. Somebody try, just trying, don't elbow me in the nose, okay. All right, so, so right here. She can move, right, if I swing at the ball, come on. She can move, right, if I get close on this side, she can move, right. Now, what happens in a game is if you aren't secure in what you're doing, the defense can get you off your spot, right? And get you off your spot. And what happens is I can push you, the ref doesn't see it, and instead of calling on, on me, he's going to call a travel on. Man, has anybody ever in your, have you ever in your life where the enemy has just got all up on you and, and you didn't got blamed for some stuff that you really had no control? Come on, man. Listen. And so he gets really, and so what David says is this. Come, come on up here, baby girl, because I want him to see it. Come stand right here. I want him to see this. Come on, right up here. Come on, come on. Right here. She's going to pivot on this foot. And so what, what David says is he won't allow your foot to move. He's not saying God is going to stop you from progress, but God is going to stop you from peril. In other words, pivot around. He says, as you pivot, I'm going to just hold your foot right here, just in case the enemy tries to come and get you, just in case he tries to tear your family up, just in case he tries to end your faith, just in case he tries to destroy the finances. He says, I'm going to hold your foot for you while you move around and do what you need to do. He won't suffer you for your foot to move. Why? Because he don't want you to have to deal with that. Oh, I feel my help coming. He says, I'm just going to hold your foot right there. Somebody, thank you, baby. Somebody here this morning is barely hanging on by a thread. And you pivoting. Thank you. You just pivoting. Huh? I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. I don't know how I'm going to get out this hospital. I'm tired of these people at work. And you feel like you're about to fall apart. And what God is saying, David said, he said to you, I got your foot. Just keep on pivoting. I got your foot. Just keep on pivoting. I got your foot, just keep on moving, right? Just keep on, keep on. He said he will not suffer you to have your foot moved. Oh, you need to know that your help is on the way. You got to feel your help coming. When you feel your help coming in a basketball game, what that means is your teammates are coming and then you can pass the ball. Get the heat off for a little bit. But he says until then, I'm just going to hold your foot. He says he won't suffer your foot to move. God is not stopping your progress. He's stopping you from falling into peril. Understand this morning that, that uh, 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 pivoting is not an excuse to not progress. Oh, I'll say that again. Pivoting is not an excuse to progress. You may not be technically moving forward, but you can become stronger right where you stand. Oh, Gary, come on. You can become stronger right where, right where you stand, Right? Also, you need to understand this morning that not all movement is progress. 
Sometimes we, we, just, just, we just do stuff that ain't got nothing to do with nothing that really got, that ain't Christ-like. And well, I look, at least I'm doing better. You're not doing better. You're just doing. I'm doing better. You're not doing better. You're just doing. He says, verse number three, he, he's going he's to hold your foot for you. You see that in the text? He would not allow your foot to be moved. Ugh. He who keeps you will not slumber. He says that he's looking out for you. Oh, church, I got some good news and I got some bad news on this morning. But before I give you that news, I need you to understand this morning that God is still in control, Rodney. That God is still on the throne. That he's still holding your pivot foot on this morning. Goodness gracious, when you understand that God is holding your pivot foot, you play the game a little bit differently because you're not worried about who's coming your way. You're not worried about losing the ball. You're not worried about traveling. You're not worried about what folks going to think about you. Why? Because your help is coming. Sister Bruce, you begin to live differently. You begin to say to yourself, whatever I am, he made me. Huh? Whatever I have, he gave me. And, and whatever I survived, he kept me. And whatever I came from, he brought me through it. Whatever I lost, he took from me. And whoever I am, he made me. And wherever I'm going, he's taking me. Because I understand that he's holding. Holding my foot. Won't suffer it to move. Because he doesn't want me to misstep. The bad news, church, is that sometime in this life, going to feel helpless. Just being honest with you, there, there'll be times where you will feel helpless. There will be times where you feel alone. Um, but you need to understand that although you may feel lonely, it doesn't mean you're alone. The good news here is that uh, he's holding your foot. God is right there, and he's your help. Sometimes in this life, it may seem like God is silent. The text teaches that, that uh, my God, I can't speak for yours, my help, he's not asleep. Text number, verse number three says, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who uh, keeps you uh, will not slumber. Look at verse number four. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Hmm. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. This word keep here, uh, we see the word keep and we see the word preserve in this text on multiple occasions. And this word uh, shamar uh, in, in, the, in the Greek uh, really is the root word for both of those. Right, and it has it has reference to a watchman. Um, okay, he says that uh, the God who is the watchman for Israel, for His people, He neither sleeps nor slumbers. He um, he he's not sleeping, and you ain't got to worry about him getting tired. He's, he's a watchman. Okay? Okay, some of y'all, okay, y'all don't know what that means. Okay, so um, in their context, uh, the city oftentimes had gates, right? We, we see this, uh, Nehemiah, right? They talk about rebuilding the walls, right? To the city, right? The city often had gates, and, and, and um, uh, in their time, there was, it was very um, contentious. Right, somebody can mob in while you sleep. Now I got Brother Joan and I got Eric, and I'm t holding y'all captive, right? And so you'd have a watchman, somebody whose job was to watch. But see, the problem with the watchman was the watchman was a human being, and if the watchman never got tired, you ever ask somebody to watch your kids, but they wasn't watching your kids? Somebody else was watching your kids. Don't look at some of y'all like, <laughs> I didn't mean like that, right? So what would happen is the watchman, uh, in order to watch the city, right, he couldn't be among the city. <laughs> so, so what the watchman would do, come here, Rodney, come on, you don't need my watchman. Come on, Rodney, you look like a real good watchman. You got your glasses on today, you got your mask. Ain't no COVID going to get this watchman. Come, come stand right here. 
So, so this is the city. I want you to stand right here, okay? This is the city. Oh, Lord, you see the, the houses in it? They're just beautiful, huh? Mm -hmm. You see the village? Mm -hmm. where, which, where, where's, the, uh, where's the market? Point at it. <laughs> Let me see which one. You got good imagination. That's mm -hmm. good. <laughs> so what the watchman would do is he would be up high in a tower so he could see everything that was happening in the city. Step over this way, though. You see the brother on security right there? Mm -hmm. The watchman also would need to be high enough so he could see the trouble coming down the road. So he says here, the God who is the watchman for Israel neither sleeps nor slumbers. So what David is saying is that the God who's high enough to look over his people to make sure they're good and who's high enough to see the danger before it comes to make sure they're good. You never have to worry about him falling asleep. What, 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 are you, what are you saying, David? That there is not a moment in your life that God is not watching out for you. There, 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 there's not a moment where God is not watching out for you. Now, I understand why that can, that can feel some kind of way, right? Because a God who can see all and do all surely has to be far enough from all to control all. Oh, goodness. But that's not what the text teaches us. The text says that he's a watchman, so we know he's watching over us, right? But he says he does not get tired. Look at, the, look at the text, verse number uh, 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 five. The Lord is your what? He's your keeper. He's your watchman, right? The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Well, what's going on here? You, you, just, you just explained to me that God was up above me, looking out for me, right? But the text then says that he is also my shade, at my right hand. Hmm. So as they would walk this journey and get tired, it would be hot. Think about yourself on a hot day. What are you looking for? Some shade, right? Good country folk, right? Looking for some shade. Y'all city people, AC, central air, right? Well, folk who, who grew up without some of that, you're right? I just need some shade, right? I want you to see this in the text. He says, I'll, I'll be your shade, right, at your right hand. Um, shade does not mean that the sun is gone. Shade is simply something to stand in between you and the sun. Oh, can you see it? He says, I'm not going to make your stuff go away, but I'll stand in between you and it. Oh, man. Somebody needs to stop praying that prayer of Lord, make it go away, and just start praying, Lord, stand in between us. Just be my shade. Sometimes God, you so focused on God making it go away. He said, I'm standing in between y'all. What's the problem? I'm your shade. I'm giving you some relief in the midst of it. Oh, man, I wish I had about six, seven folk who knows what it's like to have some relief in the midst of it. I'm talking about when you go to work and that person that's been on your head at work is still on your head at work, but it just don't bother you like it used to bother you. When you go to the crib and your spouse's been tripping and tripping and tripping, but you just, it's in one ear? Hypothetically, I don't know about that, you know. I don't. Right? You see that? I cleaned that up. Oh. Uh, when you're in the midst of it, but it just don't bother you like it used to. Think about the peace you have. When you start realizing that it's not my job to fix this grown person at my job. It's not my job to make these adults that we voted for do what they actually claimed they was going to do. It's just going to be my shade. 
we got to stop praying the prayer of the Lord and make it go away. And start praying, Lord, just, just stand in between us. You know, you, you know what standing in between us does too, Rodney, is when he stands in between us, I can peek around every now and again and just watch him work. Have you ever, have you ever had God work on some stuff in your life for you and he just gave you a front row seat and you just watched him uh, take out the folk that were trying to take you out, the folk that tried to set a trap? You just watch and you say, oh, look at that. They lost their child. Oh, look at them. Uh, they, they, they kids don't come home no more. Look at them, right, right, whatever they, that they were trying. And you say, well, look at God handling that. Just standing between us. But the other thing is this. David says that he's your shade where? What does the text say? Look at your right hand. That's intentional in the text. Think about when the, when the Bible tells us about uh, 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 in, in the final days where there will be a separation. Right. There'll be those on the left and those on. In biblical principle, the right hand always signifies goodness, strength, power. Right. I want you to see this. So he says that God will be your shade at your right hand. God will be your protection at your place of strength. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, in other words, we are so weak that even our strength needs strengthening. I used to get worried about that, Charles, and I realized that Paul said that God's power is made perfect in my weakness. So as weak as I am, is as strong as he is, so I'm not really worried about that no more. But I understand what the text is saying here is that uh, this is for, 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 for those who think that, they're, that they got it all figured out. For the folk that think that they're super strong, the self-righteous folk, so that you need to be careful. Because God has a way of even opening the floodgates into the places where you thought you were strong. And you'll need his protection. You ever had some stuff that happened in an area in your life that you thought was off guards? I'm good everywhere but here. It's almost like if your kid uh, has had all A's in, in science, struggled in everything else, all, all A's in science, they come home and bring it home a D in science. You're like, whoa, whoa, what happened here? If you didn't know nothing else, you should have knew this. Right? But sometimes God has a way of allowing us to be reminded that you're only as strong as I've allowed you to be. When we, get, when we start thinking like that, Frank, sometimes we, we start thinking we, we don't need God no more. He says that even in your, str even in your strongest places, I got to stand in between you and it. <sighs> the sun shall not strike you by day, nor by the moon by night. Let me get to where I'm going and we'll close. Uh, by day and by night is referencing uh, day is light, is light, it's visible, moon is night. In other words, I will make sure that the stuff you see don't bother you and the stuff that you've never seen coming won't bother you. Look at verse 7 and 8, we'll, we'll close here. Um, this is where he's preparing us and protecting us. At the same time, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. He shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Uh, the Lord shall preserve, keep, be a watchman, right? He gets very, very intentional here. For your what? Your soul. God's concern is your soul. I'm trying to word this properly so it doesn't come across in a negative fashion, but I, but I want you to take this in the right spirit. I, I, I'm coming from a good place. Um, sometimes we are angry with God when things don't go right with our body when he's got you in perfect peace in your soul. Sometimes we're more concerned about our bodies 
And I'm not saying you shouldn't be concerned with your body. But how concerned are you with your soul? And when he says, I'm a watchman for your soul, right? That watchman had the, had the responsibility of sounding the alarm if trouble was coming. Sometimes God will sound the alarm with your body to bring attention back to your soul. Just telling what I learned. I've, I've, I've learned sometimes that when, when I am physically hurting, I'm spiritually out of order. Sometimes when I'm in pain, it causes me to call upon him in some different kind of ways. It causes me to make some agreements with him that I never thought I would have made. Come on, my goodness. Y'all acting like y'all ain't never prayed to the Lord. If you get me out of this, I promise I'll never... And y'all didn't promise all kind of stuff. You ain't came. I'm gonna be on time for church. I'm gonna come to Bible class. I'm gonna bring. I'm gonna swear. I'm gonna give them more. I'm gonna, right. Because in that moment you're just desperate. If you, just, I swear, I swear, Lord, get me off the side of this road with this blown out tire out here in Watonga, and I promise you. Right. Some of these, some of y'all brothers, you know. I'm gonna say y'all, right? Some of y'all brothers. Lord, if you bring it back to me, Lord, I promise I'll never just. I was just ignorant and foolish, Lord. I was dumb. Right? So I know some sisters have prayed the same prayer. Lord, if you just, I didn't realize he was the one. He really a good man, Lord. He really is. He just, you know, he got his ways. But he a good one. He really, and I don't, I don't, I'm going to be better. You ain't got you just wink. Just wink. I see you. Yeah, I sure prayed it. Some of y'all. Some, some, somebody, somebody, somebody gonna rewind it this evening on the on the on the on the on the, on the, on the stream. Let me what is that prayer, Lord? Bring him back. I'm gonna try this one. I didn't try it. Right. We make promises out of desperation. And what David is saying is that God has made a promise to us to be our help out of choice. He chose you. He's, 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 he's not only protecting you, right, as your help, but he's also preparing us. How do we know this? Because he says, uh, the Lord shall keep you, right, from your, go your going out and your coming in. From this time forth, and when? Till it's done. He's preparing me to walk in my going out and in my coming in. Right? In those moments where I don't feel him. Okay, uh, let me put it to parents. Uh, when your kids get old enough where you feel like they can be home by themselves or let themselves in the house. Right? What you do is, uh, what you should do, uh, is, is you typically rational parents, you, you go over the routine with them. This is how you get in the house. This is the house key. This is the garage door opener. This is the code. Don't let nobody in. I don't even care if they're related. You call me first. Right? Don't, don't, you can't go outside. Don't turn on the stove. Don't, right? Y'all, 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 anybody? Right? All that. Right? Don't, don't call me with no foolishness. You know? Kids be calling, you think, you, oh my gosh, did something happen? I just, I wanted the last ice cream sandwich, and she said that you told her this morning. You know, just stuff like that. Like, that's not what, no. It ain't just my house, right? I'm stepping out of meetings with, with executives. You, oh, everybody all right? Yeah, uh, the air fryer, do I put it on six minutes? Like, boy, y'all don't get off my phone with this. But you go over, you go over the plan with them, right? 
because there will come a time when they may need to be able to handle themselves without you there. And what you need to understand that as you're dealing with what you're dealing with, God is not only protecting you, but God is preparing you for those moments where you got to walk and you see some folk walk away from you. For those moments where you got to walk and you just don't feel them like you always feel them, you can know that God is still looking over you and he's looking right beside. Um, many of you, some of you know, uh, I'm no longer at Oklahoma Christian. I didn't get fired. Don't do that. Uh, I, I was, uh, I, I've accepted a position at OU. Uh, we'll talk about it later. That's not what we're talking about right now. Um, still got Michigan State stuff all in my office, so don't, don't come for me. Um. But one of the things is the place is very different as relates to the bureaucracy of onboarding, right? Um, paperwork, processes, you know, it's like I filled out 762 pages and still ain't got an email, you know what I'm saying, like one of them type of things, right? But one of the things we were talking about, because, you know, when I was considering accepting the offer was, you know, this, this benefit package. I'm like, this is, it's all right. Right? Mm -hmm. So I went to the man, first day, he says, Bruce, and said, you here for an email? I said, no. He said, you here for a parking pass? I said, no. You here to get a map of where the food court is? I said, no. He said, you need key to your office? I said, no. I said, when the, when, when the benefits kick in and when it's payday. <laughs> we can talk about the rest of that stuff later, but you ain't, I ain't doing nothing, nothing for free. I just need to make sure, you know, I know who to talk to. In case some, you know, I got three kids. I need to make sure somebody got a cough, right? So, so it made me begin, to, as I'm going through that, I'm like that because there was a time when, when, uh, when, when Savannah was born, and, and uh, God bless his, his soul. We had a gentleman who was over at HR and my former employer, and he, and he that wasn't his ministry. Put it that way, y'all might, uh, might know. That wasn't his ministry. And, uh, yeah. So my baby got sick. And you know, when your baby's born, that's qualifying as a life-changing event. You can add, and if that don't change your life, I don't know what will. Right? Get my baby added, put, turn the paperwork, takes the van to the doctor, goes to finish the doctor, but when we finish, they, well, you got to pay this money. I said, no, I got insurance. I got a good job. You know, I do like, I got a good job. Right? <laughs> I got a good job. Right? So the man said, no, you got to pay this. I said, no, no, that ain't right. I said, hold on. I step outside and I call the guy. I said, look at fellow. What's the problem, right? Well, I don't think I see uh, your, your daughter's information. I said, no, I'm going to screenshot you the text where I sent it to you and you responded back to me and said received, right? Fix this. You, you know, as a parent, ain't much to get you more worked up than a sick baby, you know. You just don't stand in the way of my babies. So <clears throat> he gets on the phone, and then the joker had a nerve to tell me, well, I got her in the system, but not for that kind of coverage. I said, what? What kind of coverage? If it, the coverage don't include a doctor, well, then what do it include? <laughs> How we got coverage for a knee replacement, but not a not a a, 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 a flu shot? What? Right? And so what had happened was he messed up, right? And they got it fixed and all that moment. But I'm sitting there thinking to myself because some of these doctors always try to act like they're gonna hold you hostage, you know, like. You, well, I don't know. I'm going to stand at the door. I don't know. We're going to have to figure out something before you leave. Yeah, you better talk to the, the father. <laughs> right? So, so it made me realize that you can actually be at a place, be around a place, have access to the benefits, but not be signed up to receive the benefits. I would hate for you to be waiting on your help. <clears throat> you've been around the place. You've been coming to the place. You've had access to the benefits. But you never signed up to reap the benefit of the coverage. Oh, maybe you think you don't need the coverage. I, I declare to you that today that you do. That you do. Well, I got some good news for you. 
We sign it up, folks, today. Today is open enrollment. Well, how do I sign up, Sister Smith? I'm glad somebody asked. It's very simple. In the book of Acts chapter 2, the question is asked when the church is established, what must we do to be saved? How shall we receive this benefit? They tell them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, I, okay, so how, I know what it is that I need to do. How do I get there? Well, it's very simple. Let's, let's draw a roadmap for us. Uh, uh, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That's a very basic foundational level, right? Do you think you need this benefit? Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You've heard the word today. The question simply believes, do, uh, the question simply becomes, do you believe it? Our beliefs inform our actions, right? Are you willing to repent? You, if you believe it, then you should do something about it, right? Old folk used to say, if you love Jesus, you ought to show some signs. Huh? What are you going to do about it? Well, the Bible tells us to repent. That simply means to stop going my way, start going his way. And after I've repented, as I'm walking toward him, right, uh, 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 I, I, uh, the Bible tells us that I need, I need to confess, right? What does that mean? To publicly confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's making him my Lord. But then when I'm baptized for the remission of my sins, he becomes my Savior. The problem is, we want him as Savior without making him Lord. We can baptize you right now. And the Lord adds to the church. There's no process. There's no, no, the Lord adds to the church. And now, when you begin to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, now, when you find yourself in the evil moments, now, when the storms start raging in your life, you can ask, Master, carest thou not that we're about to perish? You have some help coming, but I sure would hate for you to be waiting on help that ain't on the way. If you need prayer, if you need encouragement, whatever it is you need, come on down front. We're going to stand. Ushers, come on down front. Let's stand our feet. We're going to sing a song of encouragement. And whatever it is you need, whatever it is you need, even if you don't know what it is you need, come on down here, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out together uh, as we pray together uh, and we sing this song, uh, the song of, of encouragement. Come, my child, let me wipe away the tears from your eyes. Let me sing a melody in your heart. Let me kiss away. We've now come down to the communion part of our service, and this is where we have the privilege and the opportunity to partake in the Lord's Supper and to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for each and every one of us. We come together on the first day of the week, according to Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7, and we partake in the Lord's Supper following the example that Jesus set for us in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29, and the Bible reads, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul instructs us to examine ourselves upon partaking the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 28 and 29, and the Bible reads, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us give thanks at this time. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now just saying thank you. We thank you for giving us this day and this time to worship you on this morning. We thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us and for this chance that we have just to remember that sacrifice. I pray that as we partake in your Lord's Supper, that we would do so on focus on nothing but you. And it's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Why did my Savior come to earth, earth and to 
the humble goal. Why did he choose a lonely bird? Because he loved me so, and so he loved, yes, he loved me so. We've now come down to the offering part of our service. This is where we have the chance to give back to God just a small portion of all the many things that he blesses us with. We give back on the first day of the week according to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And the Bible delivers the mindset we should have in giving back in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And it reads, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap also sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap also bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us bow at this heart. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again just to say thank you for all the things that you do for us, thanking you for all the many ways that you bless us each and every day, for all the things that you choose to do for us, even though you know you didn't have to. And we thank you for this opportunity just to give back to you a small portion of all those many things. I pray that everything that is offered to you on this morning will be used for uh, the furthering and uplifting of your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Father, help us this week in everything that we do to allow our light to shine so that others may see your good works. Help us to grow together as one family in one faith, sharing one focus. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 